The year is 1942. A six-year-old Jewish boy is taking the train from Los Angeles to New York. This isn't his first trip. He has been making these back-and-forth trips to visit his divorced parents who live on opposite ends of the country since 1939. Forty-three years later, the same boy publishes a piece of music called Different Trains. This piece reminisces on his time spent as a young boy on trains, and ruminates on how different these train rides might have been if he had been born in Europe instead of America. Different Trains is playing in the background right now. It's a very unique piece of music. It's performed by a string quartet who is playing along with a pre-recorded tape. The tape includes the sounds of trains and many carefully selected voice recordings of Holocaust survivors, Americans reminiscing about the time, and even his governess who accompanied him on these trips. The boy, now a man, is named Steve Reich. Different Trains is not the first time Reich worked with tape recordings. In 1965, he released a piece by the name of It's Gonna Rain. This piece is many things. A reflection of the mood in San Francisco caused by the Cuban Missile Crisis, a highlight of the musical qualities of Pentecostalist preaching, an expression of the dark times caused by Reich's divorce. This piece has not been playing in the background since it is entirely human voice. Let's take a listen. By the hand of God, glory to God, God, have you seen? Put open the door, there are no big clouds. You just open the door, put open the door, but show now, hallelujah, glory to God, God. Okay, hi, sorry. I hate to be the person to interrupt your listening experience. But for the sake of time and demonstration, I'm going to be skipping through this piece a little bit, just to make it more clear what exactly is going on. I think that's enough to get the basic idea. Now, keep in mind, this piece was made before digital audio workstations existed. Reich produced this piece of music by having two tapes playing at exactly the same speed, but the slight differences in each tape player's motors meant that they would very slowly get out of sync with each other, creating what Reich called phasing. Reich would go on to compose with phasing later on in his career, including another phasing piece made with tape recorders called Come Out, and two performed phasing pieces, Violin Phase and Piano Phase. This is Piano Phase. It's a duet. It takes two pianos and two people to play. Despite each part consisting of the same 16-note figure repeated ad nauseum for 20 to 30 minutes, this piece is incredibly difficult to play, as each person plays at a slightly different speed. Synchronizing with another musician is branded into performers from the very beginning, and to do so defeats the focus of the piece. This piece is called Adrenal Vapors, written by Mike Moraski for the hit 2011 video game Portal 2. It is a phasing piece using a six-note figure on synthesizer. Phasing pieces are part of a larger musical movement known as minimalism, which was also pioneered by Steve Reich. Moraski directly cites minimalism as an inspiration for Portal 2's soundtrack in an interview with GamesRadar. Adrenal Vapors isn't the only minimalist piece in the soundtrack, however. Take a listen to You Are Not Part of the Control Group. It makes use of very simple, repetitive chords, making slight variations on an arpeggiated texture. This is pretty standard for minimalist music, but this is game music. This track plays when movement gels are introduced as a puzzle element in Portal 2, which is sticky gunk that allows the player to jump higher or run faster. There is a second layer to this track, called Forwarding the Cause of Science. One particular sound in this layer is a synth jabbing out triplets of a single chord tone that fades in and out of the mix in the release version of the soundtrack. In the game, this layer fades in only when the player is moving quickly as a result of the gels, resulting in a really fun elevation of energy that lines up with the gameplay. Musically, this reminds me distinctly of textures present in Steve Reich's Music for 18 Musicians. This fade in and out of a quickly repeated note is present all over the place in the first movement, titled Pulses. Take a listen. The next movement of this piece, which is now playing in the background, reminds me distinctly of a track from Portal 2's multiplayer campaign, a piece that plays in the lobby where you select a puzzle to complete with your friend. It's called Robot Waiting Room Number 4. 
The awkward but regular and repetitive melodies and steady churning accompaniments are similar in each piece. Let's listen to it. One notable thing about Robot Waiting Room number 4 is the instrumentation. The main melody is a simple, pure sine wave. This brings us nicely to our next chapter. This is Imaginary Landscape number 1 by John Cage. It's one of the earliest examples of electronic music, making use of audio recordings in much the same way as Steve Reich's early works. It was written in 1939 to be played over radio broadcast. This piece includes test tones and recordings of piano and cymbals. The test tone present in this piece is also a pure sine wave, the simplest form of sound. In electronic music, sine waves are one of four or five basic sound waves used in synthesis. This pure tone is combined with dark, pitchless percussion, which is made by playing the inside of a piano by hand and by striking a cymbal and manipulating the playback speed. These percussive elements create this heavy, massive feeling atmosphere. This is a direct parallel to Moraski's The Future Starts With You. Similarly to Imaginary Landscape number one, this piece features a small selection of sounds, two synthesizers, and one manipulated recording. Like Cage's piece, The Future Starts With You focuses heavily on a basic sound wave. In this case, it's a triangle wave instead of a sine wave. A secondary synth mimics the plucked sound in Cage's work, not in timbre, but in pitch. It quickly oscillates between two close notes, sounding similar to the repeated chromatic figure in Imaginary Landscape No. 1. These early electronic works are just a small fragment of Cage's musical works. Cage was focused on pushing the boundary of what could be considered music. His most controversial piece is playing in the background right now. It's called 4 minutes and 33 seconds. It has three movements, and not a single note is played during all three of them. 4 minutes and 33 seconds is not a piece of silence, however. Whatever other sounds are happening during the 4 minute and 33 second runtime are considered by Cage to be a part of the piece. It would be silly to say that any instance of a lack of musical score is directly inspired by 4 minutes and 33 seconds. John Cage didn't invent silence, after all. That being said, many of the earliest test chambers of Portal 2 completely lack a score, leaving the ambience of the decaying subterranean facility in the forefront. Omitting music with the intent of shifting focus onto ambient noise is one of the ideas 4 minutes and 33 seconds is trying to convey. This emptiness is usually preceded by something very auditorily interesting, whether it be the bombastic score accompanying the dramatic opening sequence, a funny line from the announcer, or smooth jazz. And it's not like the game couldn't put music in these test chambers. Well over three hours of music were composed for the game, and tracks are reused elsewhere in the game. No, this silence is intended to draw the player's attention to the facility and puzzle elements. Since it's the beginning of the game, the setting needs to be established. The space given in the soundscape for ambient sounds to shine allows the facility to have an auditory identity that the score can build upon later. On top of that, all of the puzzle elements, including the titular portal gun, have responsive, satisfying, and unique sounds attributed to them. The lack of score allows the player to get familiar with them. Let's listen to some of these sounds, starting with the sound of an excursion funnel. Oh, wait, hang on. That's not actually a sound effect. That's a segment of an entire song. Uh, let's try the hard light bridge instead. Uh, wait, wait, that's, that's another entire song. Let's, uh, try the aerial faith plate? Bad news, guys. Chance music, or music that leaves an element up to chance instead of being determined by the composer, is inherent in adaptive video game scores. Mike Moraski can't predict when the player will trigger certain layers of his music to play in-game. Each quote-unquote performance led by the player is different. The song we're listening to right now is called The Friendly Faith Plate. You hear a brief moment of it when you step on an aerial faith plate, but not the same moment every time. 
The song is looping silently until you step on the faith plate, then it becomes audible for only a moment. It is impossible to listen to this song in its entirety like we're doing right now in normal gameplay. In fact, most of the music in Portal 2 is like this. All of the test chambers that have movement gels have a variant of the background music that fades in more elements as the player moves faster. We listened to that earlier. Many chambers, for example, Test Chamber 20, have several layers that come in as milestones are reached in solving the chamber. As we saw before, many individual test elements emit music while the player is close to them. The player is in charge of when they start and stop listening to the song. However, this is not the only example of chance music in Portal 2. For example, the song, I Made It All Up, is likely generated by chance. It sounds like there are a set number of pitches within a simple scale, each of which have a randomized amount of time between each repetition. Many of John Cage's number pieces, a collection of pieces named after the number of performers intended to play them, do a similar thing. Five is a piece written for five performers, playing any instrument. Each performer is given a single note and a range of time to sustain that note for. Each performance is completely different because of this uncertain amount of time to sustain each note for, although the set collection of notes results in each performance having a similar character. That's cool, but why does any of this even matter? Let's look at some of the techniques we talked about and how they stack up with different aspects of the game. Minimalism is a movement of rigor. Writing minimalist music is often like solving a puzzle. It's mathematical, calculated. Writing phasing music, for example, is an exercise in finding a small group of notes that all work well with each other when combined. The minimalism in Portal 2's soundtrack represents the core game loop, puzzle solving, and, by extension, the ludonarrative created by the player solving these puzzles. The use of electronics and silence represent the setting of Aperture Laboratories. The electronics in the soundtrack, according to Muraski, are intended to sound like they are created by the facility itself merely existing. When the soundtrack is not trying to sound like the facility, it goes silent and lets the ambient noise represent the setting instead. Chance music is an exercise in relinquishing control. Chance music spits in the face of the composing norm of covering a score in specificity. It spits in the face of micromanaging performers. Portal 2's story follows GLaDOS, the antagonist turned deuteragonist, and her journey to relinquish control over the player character. This is what chance music represents. On top of that, modern classical music was all about rejecting the norms set by previous eras of classical music. Portal 2 was also a rejection of norms at the time. It was a massive blockbuster game made by a company popularized by their first-person shooters, but it was a well-designed puzzle game. It's juxtaposed with itself. It's hilarious while having a bleak story and setting, it simultaneously takes itself very seriously and makes jokes about replacing people's blood with peanut water. The bestseller list of 2011 is dominated by sequels of already worn franchises, but Portal 2 stands on its own as one of the best video games ever created instead of on the shoulders of its prequel. Okay, now that that's over with, here's a lightning round of things that I would have liked to discuss but they weren't within the scope of this video. 1. The many, many instances of older classical music styles being referenced or mocked, including an entire aria at the end of the game. 2. The use of leitmotif. 3. The really, really good sound design. 4. Portal 1's soundtrack and how Portal 2's soundtrack relates to it, and 5. The actual plot and mechanics of the video game. Anyway, if you're interested in learning more about the music I discussed in this video, all of my sources are in the description. I highly recommend listening to the entirety of the opening piece in this video, Different Trains. It's the most moving piece of minimalism I've ever heard. And now for some thank yous. Thank you to the editors of the Portal Wiki for giving me pointers on where each track plays in the game. It made gathering footage a lot easier. Thank you to my professor for letting me ramble about video games for a final project, again. And of course, thank you for watching.